for me, the question that comes to mind is, what are you running away from? <laughs> and you, you mm -hmm. whenever you're doing something that is distracting, for the sake of distracting yourself, mm -hmm. I think it's real important to stop for a moment and say, what am I running away from? Mm -hmm. You know, am I sure that by doing this, I am running toward an empowering, expanding, mm -hmm. new experience, mm -hmm. and I am not running away from something I need to face. I think that's important. Um, one of the things I found is that adrenaline is probably the most addictive drug that we know of. And it's totally natural. You don't even need a prescription. That's right. All you need is <laughs> a little uh, carelessness, maybe, or a little craziness. Mm -hmm. And um, that was, uh, I believe that is a part of it. First of all, embracing uh, those dangerous activities so you don't have to deal with uh, the spouse or the kids or the job or anything else, but then the adrenaline itself becomes so incredibly addictive that you uh, can't do anything anyway and you can't actually well, get away from the adrenaline. And like any addiction, each time you need something more intense. That's absolutely. And yeah. it grows and grows and That's grows right. until it could destroy your life. Well, and I've known people who have gone to that extreme keep doing something more and more dangerous until in many cases it does wind up killing them. And then they do, yeah, and they die. And uh, very interesting, uh, since I had that as one of my difficulties younger in life, that I go out of my way to um, watch documentaries or interviews with people who do seek out adrenaline. Mm -hmm. And they all say uh, pretty much the same thing, that they don't really see it in the early stages as being detrimental in any way. Mm -hmm. It's very helpful for them, and by the time they realize it might be a problem, many of them cannot abandon that addiction any more than cocaine or heroin or mm. any of those other addictions. Yeah, well, introducing them to the, uh, is it the Quakers? Mm -hmm. Sitting in silence? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Until the spirit and moves them. <laughs> sitting in silence, you know, and they sit, and they sit, and they sit, and they right. sit. And uh, I, mm. I talked to someone recently who said, as they were looking at different religions and visiting different uh, approaches to spirituality, mm -hmm they thought sitting with the Quakers was the most difficult of all. Because <laughs> they just sat just and they sitting, didn't do right. anything. You're just sitting quietly. You know, the clock ticked and the clock ticked and the clock still ticked and yeah. they hadn't done anything. Mm -hmm. But it, you know, it's a spiritual discipline. Well, and that, I think that brings to mind uh, that in Western civilization, especially in the U.S., we are doers. We're not beers. Okay. Which is the difference between, I believe, Western and Eastern uh, philosophies, one of the big differences. Okay. In Eastern philosophy, Asian philosophy, they understand the value of being, which would be a Quaker attitude, just sitting until the spirit moves you or until uh, something uh, else needs to happen. And in this country, we are such doers that we don't understand the value of being. I don't. Um, you've had more experience with Eastern cultures probably than I have, mm. a direct experience. Mm. Um, in the West, one of the, uh, I grew up in a farming community, so mm -hmm. one of the uh, primary personal virtues you could have was to be industrious. Mm -hmm. <coughs> what you've just said, though, I don't think should be misinterpreted as suggesting that people from an Eastern mindset are less industrious. Oh, they're not, no. But I think they understand the balance better than most uh, uh, Westerners do. The thing that I most appreciated when I began to encounter Eastern thought and, and different ways of looking at spirituality and such was the, uh, seems to be the prevalent belief through all of it, you know, every, every example I've heard of from the Orient, um, that everything, everything, everything is interconnected. Mm -hmm. That the only real illusion is the sep is the belief that we are somehow separated from mm -hmm. our environment mm -hmm. or separate from each other. We're, mm -hmm. It's all interconnected. Mm -hmm. And so when I've looked at examples of being industrious within their uh, civilizations, cultures, history, mm -hmm. uh, it very often has to do with the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, one of my favorite little illustrations I read uh, somewhere in childhood, because uh, I, I read a lot of Pearl S. Buck and uh, all other stories of the Orient, mm -hmm. um, was a an old man who was engaged in moving dirt to create the terraced uh, mountainsides mm -hmm. that you see in the east. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, you're never going to finish this. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, no, 
But if I dig a little, and my children dig a little, and my mm -hmm. grandchildren dig mm -hmm. a little, mm -hmm. the mountain isn't getting any bigger. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. eventually it will be there. Mm -hmm. You know, and those terraces did take generations to build. And they're still working on them. And they're still working on mm -hmm. them. And, and they apparently weren't all that concerned with, with any one particular generation being able to finish them. Mm -hmm. Right. The, the only thing I think we have in the West that corresponds to that would be the building of some of the European cathedrals. Mm. That took centuries. Yeah. Yes. I mean, there were a number, the modern ones, of course, they want to build in oh, yeah. 10 or 20 years. Sure. Uh, but the oldest ones, that yeah, they spent 300 years building it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The person who laid the first foundation stone didn't expect to be there when they raised right. the bell in the bell tower. Right. They didn't have that expectation. Well, and you know how time has accelerated for us. Uh, in the West and the 21st century in the mm -hmm. U.S., uh, time is shrinking every moment. Uh, you know, it used to take uh, weeks for communication to get across the ocean from Europe to America. Mm -hmm. Now it's instantaneous worldwide. And the faster that we can communicate, that is actually time shrinking for us. Well, and it's greatly modifying our expectations. Oh, it uh, certainly is, yeah. An advertisement on television the other day for a particular vocational school. Mm where the person they were interviewing was saying how, yes, in, in only two years, I was out and had my career and off mm -hmm. with my life. Mm -hmm. And I kind of thought, what can you really learn in two years that mm -hmm. would truly empower your life? Mm -hmm. Because virtually all of the occupations that you can learn now mm -hmm. are nothing like they were 10 years ago. No, that's right. And 10 years from now, either you'll have to go back to school again, mm -hmm. or you have to be continually learning new methods. Because there's nothing you can learn today that will serve you 10 years from now. That's right. Because the world is changing so fast. That, that time frame has shrunk. Uh, something I read just recently, that freshmen in college today, 80% uh, of the careers that will be available aren't even in existence mm -hmm. when they start as a freshman four and if years they, from now. Yeah. If they choose their major when they're a freshman, oh, yeah, it's by the be time obsolete. they're a senior, mm -hmm. they'll be online for job retraining. That's right. The, yeah, the career will you, not exist anymore. You, you can't even get through the training path. That's right. Which, to me, comes back to the Eastern approach of saying maybe your vocation, career, profession mm -hmm. is something you should plan on spending your whole life developing. Exactly. 